this is Jamie Dyer welcoming you to another edition of The Quocast. And if you'd like to be a guest on a future episode of the podcast, you can. You can email quocast at outlook.com. That's quocast at outlook.com. You can tweet at the Quocast on Twitter, nearly slipped up there. Or you can visit the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the Quocast. So 40 years ago, in May of 1982, British rock legends Status Quo played concerts at the Birmingham NEC in aid of the Prince's Trust and in the presence of members of the royal family. The event, broadcast on TV and radio, helped to celebrate 20 years since the forming of a band that would become Status Quo. Specifically, the combination of guitarist and vocalist Francis Rossi and bassist vocalist Alan Lancaster. Released to coincide with these events on the 12th of April 1982 was their cleverly titled 15th studio album 1 plus 9 plus 8 plus 2. Add up the numbers. Go on. I dare you. They make 20. Very clever. Further cementing the object of the campaign, the front cover artwork featured a triangle with Roman numerals meaning, you guessed it, 20. Aside from the anniversary tie-in, this album brought a few other landmarks. This is the first Status Quo studio album to be fully produced by the band since 1976's Blue For You. The first album since Quo's original drummer John Coughlin left uh, the band in 1981. The first album to feature Andy Bowen as an official member of the band. The first album to feature... Pete Kircher, obviously, who replaced John Coughlin. Pete Kircher of the band Honeybus took over on drums. The last Status Quo studio album to hit number one on the official UK charts as well. Was it a good number one? Do let me know. So let's go on to the music. She Don't Fool Me. Uh, It was the second single taken from the album. An intriguing intro turns into a standard piece of boogie rock. Modern day Quo historians may term this as the start of Quo by Numbers, a song that sounds like it's trying to sound like status quo. Despite this, a solid performance with a particular note for Parfit's rhythmic playing and Kirch's steady drums with a slight 1980s vibe in there. So the second track, Young Pretender. Another Quo by Numbers composition that trundles along quite nicely. Definitely more than three chords, the melody offers some really pleasurable deviations that would even sound great in a different setting, such as, I don't know, France's favourite country music, or, um, you know, a, a genre with very similar tendencies to that. So the next track, track number three, side one, Get Out and Walk, a 12 bar number that shows some resemblance to a track from 1978's If You Can't Stand the Heat called Gonna Teach You to Love Me. No matter how derivative the work is though, there is no denying the pleasing production and various pieces of colour added to the core instrumentation. A full sound that includes a synthesizer and backing vocals Lyrically, uh, I have always enjoyed the line, I got ulcers from swallowing crap. Jealousy is the next track, a bouncy fun number that changes up the formula. The chorus is extremely catchy and often lives rent-free in my mind. It is the shortest song on the album, but perhaps one of the most memorable. The song was later re-recorded and re- and released, uh, to get my words out, as a single by its songwriters Francis Rossi and Bernie Frost in 1985. Despite performing the song on various popular television shows of the day, the song by Rossi Frost peaked at number 98. It's a great shame, actually. I really enjoy that. As I say, it lives rent-free in my mind quite a lot. Ah... <sighs> I love rock and roll. No, not that one. Alan Lancaster sings and pens this homage to uh, rock and roll of the past. 
the song's catchy nature and radio-friendly production make it a perfect candidate for a single, but sadly it wasn't to be. Maybe the lyrics, which utilise song titles, and the fact it wasn't sung by Rossi or Parfit made it seem less like a contender at the time. Whatever the reason, the finger-snapping, the groovy bass line, and the full stereo effect topped off with the anthemic climax make this a memorable number. I'm going to say it out there, it should have been a single. Resurrection begins side two with Ibs, Ibs. Uh, yeah, I've I've never been able to figure out what the beginning of this track means. Just another of Quo's eccentric beginnings up there with Like a Good Girl from If You Can't Stand the Heat and What to Do from On the Level. The main body of the song is a standard 12 bar, but delivered with a feel-good factor. The way that Parfit effortlessly bounces through that rhythm section is lovely. You can't help but bop your head to it. It's probably Quo by numbers, or typical Quo, with bells on, but it doesn't matter. The song was, if you'll pardon the pun, resurrected 24 years later on the Acoustic 2 That's a Fact album. It was to be Parfit's last track on a standard edition of a Quo album, and a fitting one because of the, now, sadly, poignant lyrics. Dear John, the first single from this album was released on the 19th of March 1982. It was written by John Gustafsson and Jackie McCauley. It reached a peak position of number 10 in the official UK charts. It sported a sound that demonstrated where Quo were at at this point in terms of commercial appeal. The chorus is strong, but the backing perhaps a little generic. It sounds great on the radio though and is one of the strongest songs on the album. It is further cemented in the mind by the memorable but slightly morally questionable music video. The composition was reinvented for the Acoustic 2 That's a Fact album and featured a light string section in a more sentimental reading of the song. Doesn't Matter uh, is a song that I have such mixed feelings about. Uh, it has a blandness to it, but that's kind of appealing. It offers a lot and has nice variations, but doesn't really go anywhere. Yet I can't stop listening to it. Yeah, that's right. It's got a really hypnotic nature that has me singing along. The lyrics read like an angry letter to a lover or an inner monologue, and... Uh, mix it in with repetitive riffs and hooks, including Bernie Frost's unmistakable falsetto backing vocals, and You've Got Me Hooked In. I Want the World to Know is a slight shift in tone, but a welcome one. The second Lancaster sung track on the album, uh, it's an attempt at trying something a little different, yet using some of the same frameworks. The lyrics once again utilising past song titles and lyrics, could be viewed negatively. But uh, the I want to be your brother, I want to be your friend section often gets stuck in my head on a regular basis. This song was also the B-side to the Dear John single. I Should Have Known follows I Want the World to Know, and it's another fast-played quote by Numbers track that I often forget until I listen to the album again. The opening riff and subsequent lead into the vocals give me softer ride from Hello Feels. The chugging rhythm of this song isn't new, but it is hard not to be swept away by it. Am I the only one who had no idea what the lyrics meant until it got to the chorus? All that being said, there are some nice solo guitar moments from Francis Rossi in this track. So the album ends with Big Man, perhaps a sign that band members were pulling in different directions. Hmm, I'll let you be the judge of that. A sign of what might have been, perhaps. Uh, this... Lancaster Mick Green effort takes things to a completely different place. The eerie beginning leads into a darker, uh, slickly produced soundscape. A series of memorable musical sections that sound traditional and quite possibly 
um, one of Anna Lancaster's finest vocal performances as well. While not one of Quo's best, uh, it could have been a hit for a 1980s arena rock band at some point in that decade. And I should say at this point, um, go and check out, there's a YouTube video of them miming to it on a TV show, which is fascinating uh, to to have a look at. It's out there on YouTube. Just search for Big Man Status Quo and you should be able to find it. Let me move on to the sound of this album. Well, as we know, since 1977's Rockin' All Over the World album, the band had tried to evolve the sound. After trying all manner of things over a five-year period, the Quo arrive at this point. A commercial sound that stands out on the radio, but feels weak when compared to what came before. There are a few positives, though, in my opinion. Kirch's drum sound is different to Coglan's, but it's punchy. Andy's keyboards are prominent, but not too intrusive uh, on this album. And there's also some nice use of the stereo field, including the... Um, aforementioned I love rock and roll. So in conclusion, uh, it's really easy to dismiss this album's success as a product of hype. In fact, there is a very strong argument for it. It's tough to judge specifically whether the band had become complacent, uh, whether the lineup changes affected things, or they just got swept up at that moment. It's a combination of things, I think, and the album may not be their best, but many of the compositions are nice songs, although perhaps the execution wasn't always on point. This was a bump in a very long road, one which some say they never recovered from. There will be differing opinions on that point, including my own, um, but those are my thoughts on the 1 plus 9 plus 8 plus two album from 1982 which this year celebrates 40 years tell me did uh, anyone out there attend the birmingham nec shows uh, did you buy the album on release what did you think of it do let me know and i will see you again for another quocast bye bye for now 